Our first guest this morning is Brent Newman. He comes to us from Warriors Rest. Thanks, Mom. <laughs> and he has some important and engaging information for us about leadership. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Brent Newman. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, so first of all, before she walks off the stage, can we get Stephanie a hand? She's, she's done a lot to get me to this point, please. Yes. She's, uh, she's the lady that, that, um, that gets to herd the cats, so to speak. So, and I'm one of the cats. So um, I am so glad you're here, and I hope you are too. Um, I got here, I got in the airport about five o'clock yesterday. I, I uh, fly out of Sacramento. And when I did, I was kind of looking around um, last night, and some of you were having a, having a great time, and I thought, boy, I wonder how they're going to feel in the morning. So <laughs> good on y'all for being here, even though some of you might be a little numb. Um, so I'm kind of interested, and I'm going to walk around a little bit, but um, I'm kind of interested who's here. I know there's, there's definitely some familiar faces, but um, who is here from, the, and I won't be able to see the people online, but you can go ahead and raise your hand too. Here, who's who is here from the Atlantic region? I just want to kind of eyeball right here, right here. Okay, a couple of you. How about Central Plains? Okay, right back here. Um, Midwest? Okay. <laughs> we got that section and Connie. All right. Um, <laughs> Northwest. Any Northwesterns here? They're, they're, oh, they're on Zoom. Um, Northeast. Woo! Nice. Oh, and, and dispersed across the room. Very nice. Okay. Um, South Central. Okay. Way to represent. Nice and up front. Color coordinated. Thank you, ladies. Um, Southwest. Okay. All, all right up the middle here. Man, there's a lot less enthusiasm from the Southwest people. Are you noticing this? This is like present. I, I vote present. Um, Southeast. I was, I was getting to you. Okay, right in here, good, good enthusiasm. All right, Western, right here. <laughs> and uh, what did I miss? And I got Southwest, right? Okay, let's, Southwest, let's do that again, Southwest. Okay. All right, we'll work on that. Um, all right, so I'm also kind of curious. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of curious. How many of you, this is your first time at board chapter training? Ra raise them high. Oh, that's fantastic. Welcome. Yeah, give yourselves a little hand on that. It's fantastic. Okay, so how many of you have been two or more times? Just k keep your hand up. Okay, oh, it's interesting. They're like on the back, on the sides. I see what's going on. How about three or more times? Five or more times? Five or more? Seven or more? Too many to remember. Okay, so we so we know who the lifers are, sir. How, how many? Do, what's your name? Ellen. Ellen. What what's your what's approximately how how many times have you been here? Probably three times, except for when COVID struck in 2008. Since 2008. So, I'm thinking that's a lot of years. Yeah, thank you for keep coming back. Appreciate that. You have a lot of it. You have a lot of experience in this. <laughs> and where, where, what's your chapter? Uh, Tennessee Valley. Oh, Tennessee Valley. Genesee. Valley. Genesee. Upstate New York. Got you. And did is that include Rochester? That's it. Okay. Yeah, we just we just tragically lost that officer. Okay. Yeah, so One of yours. Was long. Yeah. And I knew it. Yeah. Well, thank you and welcome. Well, welcome all of you, and. Um, we're going to talk about leadership, and um, I have uh, had the privilege over the course of a long career of uh, being engaged in a lot of leadership training, both on the receiving end and the giving end. Um, but when cops asked me to, to do some leadership, I wanted to do something that is really um, particular and it's tailored to this group. I wanted to do something that, um, instead of just some, some off-the-shelf stuff, we talk about some leadership principles. My goal is that when you, when we finish this morning, and, and I have another session this afternoon, I'm building rapport with law enforcement agencies, that you will feel a little bit more equipped to do what you do, 
and that you feel like there's some, some definite takeaways that when you take that back to your chapter, um, there's, there's some to do's. And one of the things I'm going to invite you to do is throughout the morning, and it's going to go pretty quick, but anytime that you have kind of an aha moment, um, I want you to just to circle it. If you've got a highlighter, kind of highlight it like something that just goes, ooh, that, that is applicable to me or someone on my team or something I want to take back, something I want to implement. Um, just do that because at the very end, I'm, I'm gonna, we're going to do a little thing with that, okay? So that's, that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is um, as we talk about the leadership and we make it very, very applicable to our chapters, uh, my background includes a lot. Uh, I did 31 years in the California Highway Patrol. I'll tell you just briefly a little bit about that, some of my experiences. But I've also served on a lot of nonprofit boards over the years. And I've been a, a nonprofit volunteer over the years. Um, and I've been a little bit around cops, of course, too. That's one of them. Um, so I hope to bring some of that experience. The other thing I will um, be asking you to do from time to time is um, engaging both in terms of writing some things down. I have a very simple note set because I really want you to kind of stream your notes, stream your thoughts, not mine. And I'm going to be asking you to kind of interact with each other, including, including um, those that are online, okay? I won't ask you to do like really silly things, but I will um, be engaging. So I wanted to warn you about that. All right, so Mike, um, you know what? I just realized my clicker is... Is it on the podium? Is this it? Ooh, didn't recognize it. Okay. So um, I want to tell you a brief story. <clears throat> June, I wrote the date down, June 27, 1990. Um, I had about a year and a half uh, as a CHP officer, California Highway Patrol, working in the Los Angeles area. I worked southeast LA County. And um, on June 27th, I was about a year and a half into my officer career, and I found myself in my, uh, where I lived in North Orange County, at my first law enforcement line of duty death memorial service. And I remember it was Officer Tommy De La Rosa. I very, very vividly remember that. I didn't know Officer De La Rosa. I didn't know his family. But they had the event at my church. And there, were me, there was me and about 5,000 sworn, and I don't know how many others. And it's, it's all the things that we're used to. A very uh, honorable service, um, many of the, the elements of that service uh, that, we, that we have come to expect. It was, it was amazing. And then a very, very long uh, procession uh, up to, to Brea, um, where he was laid to rest. And I sat there as a young officer just um, with a whole bunch of mixed feelings and emotions. Um, never had experienced something like that before. Been to funerals, but this, this, was, this was something completely different. I felt pride um, in wearing the uniform. I felt great honor. Um, he was uh, on a drug bust in Downey, which ironically was part of the area that my station worked um, in Los Angeles County. And uh, he was essentially ambushed, um, shot and killed. And I remember feeling the connection with that because our station was right next to Downey and we patrolled through there. Um, I remember feeling a lot of conflicted emotions too. Just uh, as a, I think I was 24 years old, came on when I was 22, and just processing through. And then, but I wasn't a survivor because I didn't know Tommy and I wasn't you know, directly affected. Uh, but then just about three years later, Bruce Hinman um, was a CHP officer. And uh, he was on the 101 helping a um, disabled motorist. And um, Bruce basically got run over by a drunk driver. He got pinned beneath the vehicle. And despite heroic efforts, they couldn't get him out in time. And Bruce perished. Well, Bruce is someone that I worked with quite a bit. Um, I used to be on um, these task force on the weekend. And we'd go all over LA County, essentially trying to arrest impaired drivers before they, they crashed. And uh, I worked with Bruce on numerous occasions. He was uh, about a year ahead of me on the job. He was a young officer, and I just found him to be um, cheerful, very healthy, not, not cynical, and, and he's one that came on for the right reason. He wanted to help people. He wanted to save lives. He wanted to prevent the kinds of events that actually took his life, ironically. And I remember for the first time that feeling that many of us, uh, all of us, in fact, have felt, a just sense of loss and um, a great, great sense of mourning. So since that time, 
We've lost, just in my agency, we've lost 62 officers to line of duty death. And that doesn't include um, uh, many to suicide. And yet, with all of that, and I started to promote after about 10 years and so on, um, I had very, very little concept of cops. Um, it wasn't until about 20 years into my career that I really started, this organization started to get into my brain a little bit. And when you think about 62 line of duty deaths, I, did, I wasn't able to attend every one of those funerals, but I, I attended quite a few. And as I attended quite a few, um, and many of them were coworkers and friends, some of them very, very um, dear, um, I still didn't know about cops. So 31 years after I started, at the end of 2019, I retired, and I immediately went to work with Warriors Rest Foundation, um, doing the kind of work that we're all involved with, which is basically serving the survivor community. Um, I have had the great privilege over the last two and a half years of being at all of the um, uh, TLEs except one. I had a little medical incident that, that jumped out at me that preempted one, but I'm, I'm good now. Um, and uh, most relevant to this group, I, I've served on a lot of nonprofit boards. Now, the reason I started with a little bit of my own story is not to gain sympathy or anything like that. I actually want you to think about your story. Because when we talk about leadership, when we think about how you're leading your chapter and what your chapter's mission is and how you're going about it and how you're interacting with volunteers and so on, we have to remember where we came from. Because it turns out that the best kind of leaders are humble. And humble leaders, they know where they came from. The thing that connects all of us, whether we're survivors, spouses, moms, dads, significant others, children, coworkers, whatever our constituency is, we all share a common bond. Uh, what, do, what do we say? This is the family that, that no one wants to be in, and yet we're, we're super glad we are because of the connection. I could see that like every other cops event I go to last night. It was, it was pretty beautiful. Um, but you're all here because of that common bond. And just like um, when I became a CHP officer at the, at the young age of 22, I had no idea that I would be in leadership positions. That's not something I aspired to. And I had, to, I had to work at that. And I always like to say it's like um, you, you don't become a chef by, by eating, <laughs> right? <laughs> you become a chef, you could be a really good eater. And believe it or not, I am a really good eater. But you become a chef by studying how to make food, how to, how to interact ingredients and so on and so forth. And that's kind of like leadership. So we all start from a similar point. We all have unique stories, and yet we have um, a similar um, thing that connects us. If you reflect on the loss of your officer, um, I, get to, I get to do uh, facilitate the survivor panels. I get to interact with a lot of survivors on an ongoing basis. And one of the common themes is that when you had that loss, the worst day of your life for most people, it was um, all you could do to get through that day, all you could do to get through the next day, that week, uh, much of what happened because of the grief and the shock, the pain, the awe, it's, it's forgotten. People have told you things that you later really had no memory of or at only remembered when someone told you. And then you went through mourning and grief and you struggled and you fought and you grew and you healed. And over the course of time, you went through a process by which all of you somehow overcame, and that's what you are, you're overcomers, to where you are sitting here today or you're online, because from that horrible day, you're now a volunteer leader in one of the greatest organizations in, in these United States. You are overcomers. Give yourself a hand for that. I'm going to. So you're different today than you were back then. You've changed, you've grown. And some of it was by this, through the school of hard knocks and others by just no, normal maturation and growth processes. So here's where these topics, um, here's where we're gonna go today. We're, get, we're starting right now with how did we get here and we're already, we're already talking about that. 
it's really important to understand that as opposed to some other leadership positions you have, you might have gone to business school and you're a business leader you might have done this this is a very unique entree into positions of leadership in this organization both at the chapter board level as well as the national level um, and one of the things that I like to think of next is um, kind of a bottom line question is what's the point point? and so what do I mean by that what's the point so let me give you an example uh, in terms of what is the point of your chapter. Everything is going to be geared this morning around your chapter. So if I asked you about what's the point, um, there's about, I'm going to illustrate this. There's about 100 and something CHP offices um, in, in, the, uh, in the state of California. And when you go into every CHP office, there's some, there's some commonality. Okay? And if you're from a single agency, you may not have had the, the privilege of doing this. I've been to dozens of our CHP offices over the course of my career. And even my family, as they've came to visit me on different assignments, they'll, they'll comment on this. And I've, I've sensed the same sometimes in police stations. There'll be the same badge logo on the, on the outside of the doors, the same stenciling. Um, when you walk in, one of the things that always grabs me is, is the smell. You can smell, it's a combination of uh, paperwork, uh, semi-chrome, um, shoe polish, brass cleaner, all, all of that gets mixed in. Maybe, maybe, maybe the, uh, some gun cleaner, some of them have stations there. You have uh, sounds of boots going across concrete or hard, hard floors, linoleum floors, chairs scraping across those floors in the briefing room, and then usually you can hear somewhere off in the distance, you'll hear a dispatch, you'll hear on, over, over the speaker. If you look out in the back lot, what do you see? Well, you see patrol vehicles. And if you go to the next station over and the station 500 miles away, guess what you're gonna find? Vehicles that look pretty much exactly like that. Um, you will look in the, in the cupboard there, they still maintain uh, paper, and you'll see policy manuals. And the ones that are in Southern California look like the ones in Central and in Northern. In fact, they're absolutely identical. We have high patrol manuals, high patrol guides, we have general orders. And in fact, the joke is um, it's mostly true, which is what makes it funny that if you need to order toilet paper, we have that is written down. If you need to know how to use toilet paper, you're probably in the wrong job. Um, so, and the other thing that all of those places have is they have the same big picture mission. If you ask any CHP officer, any police officer, any deputy sheriff, they probably have, whether they can quote the mission or not, they know inside what, why they exist. But at the same time, each office that I go to has its own characteristics and personality. It has its own character. Some of you walk in, it seems more business-like. Some are a little funner. Some are a little brighter. Some are a little darker. Some of them are known for high productivity. Others are known for not as high productivity. Um, some have... Uh, relationships with the community uh, and their impact on that community that is quite a bit different than a station maybe even right next door. And then if you interact with the officers, you'll see differences in morale. And there's nothing particularly unique about this when I'm talking about CHP. This could be any law enforcement organization that has multiple stations and sometimes even units within a single department. It's all the same, but it's different. So I want to ask you, and this will be maybe the first time for our, our, um, our runners, um, what is it, what would you guess would explain that I can have all of those things the same that I described, and I could have described even more, and yet there's differences? What, what might explain some of those differences? Right, right up here. I think it would be the attitude and demeanor of the leader of the station. Okay, good. More. What might explain it? And the people that are employed there. Okay, and, wh and when you say the people that are employed there, what, what particularly are you thinking about, if anything? Just their backgrounds, their various different backgrounds from like North California to South California. Sure, yeah. Dave. Commitment to the mission. Commitment to the mission? And I'll just briefly elaborate on that. 
Well, um, briefly. Yeah. <laughs> you know him? You must know him. Can you tell Dave and I, have, we, we, we're both from California, he, he's my brother. Yeah, um, just the, there are people who take assignments to check a box. There are people who have commitment to that assignment. And there are people who truly want to push the mission forward. Okay, cool. Great. Another. Brian's giving you an attaboy. Yeah, I think all those things, and you know, you said about the people, e even one of the things is, for example, in our Los Angeles offices, they get a lot of new officers. So the difference between working in a new office with a lot of young officers versus working in a very, very seasoned, and I've had the privilege of doing both, that alone, um, but sir, what was your name, Kim? Did I see your name? So, the, but the first thing that he said, which I think is probably the most important factor, is kind of the temperature of the leader. It's the tone that is set from the leadership. And do you see a parallel with this organization? With Concerns of Police Survivors, we have chapters spread across the country, divided into, into regions, and each one of you essentially has the same mission. And we'll, we'll touch on that in a second. And yet, what I notice when I travel around the country is every one of you has your own take. You, have your, you put your own investment, your character, your experience, all these things that we said. And one of the most important factors in all of this is exactly what Kim said, it's the leadership. So that's what I want to focus on and then give you the gift this morning of some self-reflection with the idea that my assumption is that you're running a good chapter, maybe a great chapter, and how do you take that from good to great or continue to have a great chapter to, to accomplish the mission? So that's, that's uh, my approach this morning. So when I say, um, what's the point? I'm going to ask you, and I'm going to, and this is, this is, I'm going to get you involved here for a second. Why does your chapter exist? Notice the question isn't why does COPS exist, but why does your particular chapter exist? I want you to personalize that and give, give that some thought. Um, what is unique about your chapter? So I, I mentioned the CHP example. Well, think about your chapter. What would, if I visited yours, might be a distinctive that I might notice about your chapter in particular versus Others, others that I would interact with and visit. Um, so what I'd like you to do is you've got the, that note sheet there, and under, you can do under that section of what's the point. Just take the time to write a couple of sentences, a small paragraph, in terms of what those differences are. We know there's a lot of similarities, but really think hard about what some of those differences might be, and I'll give you a couple minutes to do it. Okay, just a few more seconds, to maybe to finish the current thought or sentence that you're on. And then what I'm going to ask you to do as you're doing that, because some of you already done, is turn to a neighbor, whether it's someone from your chapter or you want to interact with someone new, and just share a thought or two about what makes your chapter unique. In fact, it might be more interesting to you, as well as to me, as if you interact with someone who's not from your chapter, because I know chapters tend to sit together but that might, that might be a little bit more interesting. If you're online, what I would invite you to do is to post, um, uh, use the chat feature, if you're, especially if you're not around other people right now, and, and uh, populate that chat feature with what's, what's unique about your chapter. So go ahead and, and visit for a couple minutes.
Okay, take about maybe 30 more seconds and then I'll, I'll grab your attention back. And we will need runners. Okay, beautiful. Kind of finish up your current thought. Okay. So just continuing in this vein, you guys are awesome, by the way. I'm looking around the room. Some of you are really getting into this discussion. I love it. So we got runners again. And I'd like for a number of you to just share something that you heard, not that you shared, but something that you heard from somebody about what's unique about their chapter. OK, so populate your hand. I'd like to get like seven, eight of these out. Brian's got one. Brian, thank you. Uh, the suffix chapter uh, is the post 9-11 is very unique for their chapter. Yeah, so that to be in, where, where is suffix right, right here? Yeah. Metro New York said, so yeah, that puts a uh, big imprint on your whole experience, right? Yeah, good. Great job, Brian. Okay, let's keep it going. Others. There was way too much talking to be quiet now. From our chapter, Genesee Valley Cops, we were talking about how we have really great and strong relationships with federal agencies on down because Ellen has been very proactive about getting on the phone when there's a line of duty and introducing herself, saying, you know, what can we do for you? So that's unique. Super cool. Keep going. Thank you. Pat, and then we'll go Lynn. Or actually, we'll go, let's go Pat over here in Midland. Amelia and I were talking about um, our, our differences in our chapters, but mostly how much we are alike, and realized that we have created a sense of community within our chapters, mm -hmm. that all the things that happen within your community is actually happening in our chapters, too, like our own little communities. Yeah, o outside of uh, cops, Topics. You're talking life, yeah. right? So yeah. Our senses of community Beautiful. for ourselves. Okay, let's bounce over here. Yes, ma'am. Hi, Debbie from Idaho states that Idaho absolutely loves their police department. There's no anti defund or anything going, so they get full support all across the state. And the other thing is that they're in two different time zones. Uh, so that's unique about them. And scheduling and making plans and everything makes it a little difficult. So. Yeah, wow. Cool. Okay, Lynn? or whoever over here. I wanted to share what I learned from the folks of their chapter, which I thought was pretty um, compelling, is that despite not typically having a lot of line of duty deaths, their core of their chapter really has stayed true to the mission of cops, and regardless of the length of years, step up whenever there is a need for something. And I, I thought that was pretty compelling. It really speaks to the fact that those survivors through the years have always wanted to be there for new families. Yeah. And it impressed me. Yeah. It's the Kansas chapter. <laughs> Very nice. OK. Uh, Mary from Miami area was sharing how densely populated the Miami Metro Dade area is in the South Florida chapter and how it's not unusual for a law enforcement funeral to draw tens of thousands of of uh, officers from just that immediate area. Yeah, yeah, the funeral could be larger than some departments. The funeral larger than some departments? Oh, yes, in, in Miami-Dade, wow. and yeah. That's just how dense the uh, population is there yeah. in our area. So our chapter covers, you know. 
a whole lot of people. A lot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Okay. Anybody else? I learned that in, in Dave's chapter, they have at least three people in leadership that have moved in from other areas, from other chapters. Um, so they were able to take their knowledge from their past chapters and kind of help develop the chapter that they're currently in. Okay. You guys absolutely A plus um, in terms of identifying. So we're getting, we're getting the fact that there's some similarity. If I, if I took the time, we won't. But if I took the time and said, hey, all the things that are similar, we probably have a pretty long list, right? That's the easy part. But you also realize, just like the CHP offices, I'm coming right to you, that there's differences. Please. Yeah, there was, um, so Deborah from Michigan shared on the chat um, something that was unique about theirs is hands-on and personal interaction with our departments and survivors. And she said, our support has no expiration date. I thought that was pretty cool. Love it. Thank you. And thanks for chasing me down on that, too. Yeah. Yeah, anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Oh, wait, you got, you got to have a microphone. That's the only, the only rule. I just enforce them, I don't make them. Oh, one thing that's really, really unique about South Florida is that it's so culturally diverse because in Miami alone, you can have people from all around the world. So our chapter would have to deal with something like that. Yeah, both, both within the, the United States, but you also have international, a lot. Of, yeah, beautiful. Language, culture. Yes, sir, right up here, one, one more. Hold on just a second. They're getting their steps uh, in. Something unique about New Jersey, we have two chapters, but both of them cover the whole state because we have one for the state uh, police and one for the, the local police. So it's unique in New Jersey. And, and people have to travel a long way sometimes to go to the meeting because we cover all the way up the highest North Jersey down and all the way to the bottom of New Jersey. So. Well, I can add one more thing to that. The other thing about your chapter is the way you talk, because that is, I teach with Madeline Newman a lot. Everyone else has an accent except us. Uh, that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Well, I just wanted to add what's unique about the Northeast Florida chapter is we have Charles Schindholzer and Janice Lampe. Yep. <laughs> true, true. Okay. so. Um, thank you. The, the, you're illustrating to yourselves, while we're the same, we're different. And every chapter, just like those CHP offices I mentioned, has different unique factors. And the interesting thing is, because it would actually involve you, is the other big difference is leadership, right? You each have your own history. You have your own personal history. And I, and I invited you a few moments ago to, to consider that. I could see the look on some of your faces. You were, you were going back to that day, and you were thinking about what your journey has been like over those years from that horrible day until today, where you're, where you're able to sit here and you're giving back as a leader. Like others, your chapter has strengths, and you're very proud of those, as you should be. You know what your distinctives are. You know the things that, that really stand out and that you, and I get to see this as I travel around, that chapter you can see the pride, and the pride is usually around certain issues, about execution or their hospitality or their relationships or their, the diversity of who they serve and so on. And you should be proud of that. And by the way, there's no catch to this. There's no, there's no uh, you know, I'm not dropping the other shoe. You should be proud. At the same time, if we're honest, in the best chapter, the best organization, the best police organization company, there's always things that could be strengthened. There's always areas in which you say, you know what, we're doing this pretty good, but if I really could have my preference, and I'm not sure how to do it, but I would really like to see more of this or less than this. And so when you're talking about running a chapter, you're really running it in the healthiest situation you're running as a team. And as a team, one of the things that is super helpful and also avoids conflict, and we are going to um, talk about conflict, but it's to have a shared vision, starting with your leadership team, but really th through the whole membership of your chapter. So people talk about those, those are you know, kind of business type words, shared vision and so on, but let, let me see if I could make it a, a little bit more practical. When you talk about shared vision, it's really the thing that when you all are together, it's the thing you kind of dream about. It's the future, the way things could be um, that isn't quite there now. 
Um, you probably have things that you want to improve or things that you want, uh, programs that you want to expand or areas that you want to grow. Maybe it's membership reach, maybe it's a fundraiser you've, you've, you've kind of kicked around starting, but it's, it's shared membership. And what this slide illustrates is that we're, we're shared vision, and it's not just the leadership team, it's really through your entire membership you want to have the shared vision. It's tied in with the big picture nationally, but it really starts with listening and observing to as many people within your sphere of influence as you possibly can. So when I was a police leader, what I was doing is constantly talking to people, constantly listening. I retired as a chief. I was always out, always not only walking my headquarters building, but go on a ride-alongs. I'm out on patrol. I'd show up at accident scenes or traffic stops. And of course, I'm concerned about whatever the media safety issue is, but I would always have these conversations, whether I found officers in a coffee shop or on the side of the road or in the office, whatever the context was, and I'm just asking them about how they're doing and asking about the department. And it turns out, and of course with my leadership team, but as you, more people that you talk to, it starts to emerge as to what's on people's hearts and minds, where, what kind of the collective need is, maybe where I'm missing as a leader or we're my senior leadership team where we're missing it and it's really no different for you. So shared vision, you, it's, you can't have it unless you're engaged with people and you're, lis and you're listening and observing. Not just listening, but eyes up and observing. So sometimes shared vision arises from discontent. What, th what that means is everybody agrees that's broken. That's not functional. We're not serving this, or we should have a we should have a something. Those kind of should have statements. And so, from discontent, sometimes it comes out. You know what? We need to, and then you can fill in the blank. And maybe you've had that experience in your chapter. That's there's nothing wrong with that. It's discontent. What's not working? That that can uh, feed into a shared vision. But more often, shared vision comes from possibility, not so, so much like trying to fix something that's broken but more how can we take what we have together and make that even more impacting, make that more inclusive, make that more effective in, in meeting the mission. And there's, a, there's an old phrase, what happens when there's no vision? Well, when there's no vision, people just kind of do what they think is right. It erodes teamwork. It leads toward mediocrity. Mediocrity leads toward dysfunction, and dysfunction leads to, I mean, in an ultimate sense, like the death of an organization. I'm not worried about that with, with this group, but you could be, without a shared vision, you could bump along for a long time in a really mediocre state. And it's just below the surface where everybody would know it, and we're just kind of all dissatisfied and so on. And I would suggest to you, if you have any of that in your, in your sphere of influence, or you have some of those thoughts, it may be because your team has not done enough of that first bullet, observing, listening, and then discussing as a, as a team and as a group and involving uh, people who want to be involved in that discussion, your membership. Hey, where do we, where do we want to take our chapter? What's our particular take on the overall COPS mission? Where do we need to go? And John Maxwell, that quote down there is, you cannot attain, you cannot acquire, you cannot achieve that which you can't see. So this is an important point. Now, I want to recognize that I'm starting off um, this morning, and we're talking, this is really abstract. This is, you know, we're talking about vision and, and where you're going. It's going, to, it's going to start getting much more concrete or practical. But you're going, to, you're going to see that if you skip this, remembering where you are, and, and really focused on shared vision, do we have one as a team? That's what I might be asking if I was in your shoes. If so, what is it? Um, that would be a great conversation to have amongst your chapter. Hey, do we have a shared vision? What do you think it is? See if you come up with the same answer. If it's different, it might not be shared. Okay, so um, we are, I'm gonna get through, okay, perfect. We're gonna get through another uh, bullet but, and then we'll take, a, we'll take the first break of the morning because that's very, very important to do that. Um, so the next um, piece that we're gonna go to um, when we're talking about chapter leadership is on um, your most important goal. And um, a few minutes ago, I asked you to write down a statement as to why your chapter exists. And then we just talked about vision in terms of where you're going, where you'd like to go. Um, 
and, you're th and you were really challenged to start thinking about the future. So not just existing operationally, and, and, and you need to do that, fulfill, fulfilling all the tasks that a chapter does, but stretching beyond that to say, hey, we want to do all these tasks, and where, where does our chapter need to go? And you notice I'm not telling you or suggesting, because that's something that you as a leadership team, that's your privilege to come up with that. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't dare to uh, assume what that would be. So given that, um, here's what I'd like you to do. We're going to have another uh, opportunity for you to kind of jot some notes down. We're going to have some interaction. I'm going to do a debrief. And about the end of that, I might have a couple things to say, and then we'll take our first break. Are we good? So just a few more minutes. OK. So what I'd like you to do is this is, this is the COPS mission statement. And we probably all have it, have it memorized. I put it up there for my convenience. Uh, but here's, here's the COPS mission statement. Rebuilding shattered lives. That's always, that's always what sticks out with me because the rest of it follows, follows very naturally. But I want you to think about your own chapter. And when you think about that chapter, what would be your most important goal? If you thought, what, what, what is our most important goal of our chapter? Take a minute, take a sentence or two, and write that down. And I'll give you, I'll give you about 90 seconds to do that. Uh, and let me say one more thing. I should, have, I should have asked two ways. One is, what's the port, most important goal for the chapter? And I'd like you to write a second, which is, what is your, as a member of that team, what's your most important goal? Okay, so two things. Go ahead. Okay, so not surprising to me, many of you, like you wrote, it was pretty quick. You knew what that was. You put it down. You already, you already pinned down looking up. So if you're in that position, go ahead and share with the neighbor um, at least one of those two statements, either your chapter, what you think the chapter goal is, or a personal goal. You can share either or both. Go.
three. Okay, come on. Yep, there we go. Thank you. you. You put it down and brought it up. Okay. So let me bring it back to the to the main here. So let me ask you before I'm gonna I'm gonna ask for some some feedback here. And the online, by the way, um, I I just had a I just had a little revelation. So um, when we had the feedback over here from Michigan, I'm looking at our two ladies. I'm going, like, they're from cops. So I'm thinking, is someone back here from Michigan? Or no, she's actually doing the online. So when she's giving the, the feedback, it's, it's OK. So I'm, I'm the last in the room to figure that out. <laughs> so um, online people, you're doing awesome because you're populating. We're going to get to some of that feedback in a second. Before I ask for your feedback, though, let me ask you, was that, how many of you thought that was like super simple, walk in the park? OK. A few of you, maybe a fourth, something like that. How many of you went, ooh? Dang, like this is this is a little bit challenging, or I'm not sure, or some, some there was a little ambiguity. Nobody. Okay, so of the hands that didn't go up, where are you guys at? <laughs> <laughs> They're so confused they don't even know how to answer the question, and I, it's my fault. So let's have the runners go. I'd love to hear from several of you, and then we'll, we'll go to our online. Uh, I'd like to hear from several of you in terms of what either a personal or a chapter goal was. And tell us, if you could, which one it is, if it's not obvious by the context. Um, for me, now in a leadership role, is to break down those walls in the survivors that I see I had built up around myself. I was very angry, and I needed to direct, redirect that anger and grief into something positive. That's when I knew I had to turn to cops, mm. and it's worked for me. And I see it in other survivors, the ones that are resistive to come to meetings and to be involved, and you know. But we keep chipping at the wall, and you know, get a couple more to come now and then. But um, for me, COPS is a, was a lifesaver. I don't know where I'd be today without mm -hmm. my support group. And I just, you, you got to keep working on those that have been resistive to get involved or let us in, I guess. I can see that that's a powerful source of, mo source of motivation for you and fuels vision. Yeah, that's, that's great. How many identify with that, with, with her, with that comment? Yeah number of hands all over the room. And you online, I can't see you, but I, I can feel the hands going up. Um, OK, next, next one, Cheryl. So for personally, my line of duty death was in 83, and cops wasn't around. So personally, I want to make sure that survivors don't feel alone and know that they have support. Because what my siblings and I went through was a lot of loneliness, a lot of struggle. Thank you. Who's next? Dana. Yeah, let's go. Let's go here, Dana. Um, for me, a personal goal for our chapter is to reach out to, um, I mean, really reach out to our seasoned survivors, because there are a lot of people, and it kind of made me think about it. Really, just now with what she said, there are people out there that um, were before cops, and or were very close to the beginning of COPS. Mm -hmm. And I know being a 1986 survivor, so COPS was only two years old, I know how important this organization has been for my entire family. And some of that didn't happen until 25 or 30 years into it. So I know there are people out there in our chapter that don't even realize they think it's too late. And it's my goal to, to let them know it is not too late. 
and that we're here for them. Beautiful. Thank you. Hi. Um, we're from the Georgia chapter, and I think, woohoo, yeah. go Georgia, go Braves. They won last night. Thank you very much. Um, no, I think for our chapter, one of our biggest goals um, is to find new ways to get our survivors more engaged with our chapter um, past the initial, yeah. you know, and, and going to police week. And then it just seems like they seem to fall off of being mm -hmm. involved. And we're trying to find new ways to get that to happen. And our other bigger goal, biggest goal is finding new and inventive ways to try to raise money and get, um, you know, um, more support um, because yeah. in 20, well, this past May, we had 48 just from our state yeah. officers, line of duty deaths. So um, that hit our coffers pretty hard. So, yeah. um, and personally, I just, I, I'm a spouse. Yeah. And so um, I'm trying to find new ways of being more engaged with the spouses. Um, mm -hmm. Not that I don't deal with other people, but a spouse knows what a spouse went through. A parent mm -hmm. engages with parents and they feel that connection regardless of how their officer died. And so I'm trying to, I'm, I literally yesterday went through and bought thinking of you cards and I'm gonna go through our list and send them to every single spouse, just letting them know, just wanted you to know, I'm here, send my card, I don't sleep, haven't in five years, so <laughs> hence the bags, you know. But yeah, that's kind of our, our biggest goals, I guess. Beautiful, thank you. Okay, another over here. And then we'll come right here. Yes. So um, for me, it's growing the organization and with the community. Um, before my wife was killed, I didn't know what COPS was. Mm -hmm. Had never heard of the organization. Building those relationships within the community so people know ahead of time. And the departments, my department didn't know what COPS was. So reaching out and being a community service to these organizations that the academies, the, the police departments, uh, the sheriff's departments, the constables, every organization out there should know what we are and what we provide to people if they have even a critical incident okay. within their departments and stuff. So um, well done. I feel like that's, for me, would have been key to know ahead of time. And yeah, I, I feel that gap as you're saying that, yeah. And, and the passion and the motivation that you have. So maybe two more, because I know there was right here and then over here, maybe, maybe three, and then we're gonna hit online. Go ahead. Ditto and getting survivors to hands-on programs. Got you. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, back here, right here, please. So for whatever reason um, that I haven't quite figured out, um, I kind of fell through the cracks. And my husband died a year and a half ago, and mm -hmm. nobody from COPS reached out to me. And it wasn't until I came to police week, my first year as a first family, that I realized I didn't have the experience that a lot of other people had with cops. And so it was kind of at that point that I decided I really wanted to get involved and make sure that nobody had that kind of experience that I had. And I've realized, though, that going through the experience that I have, I now bring a lot of extra skills to the table, you know, and I'm able to, you know, really help a lot more. And so what I personally want to do is bring a little bit more um, structure and um, process and that's my background um, before I quit working um, structure background process orientation standardization to our chapter so I'm hoping that I mean we do a great job but it's more of a knee jerk what I'm noticing you know it's get it done you know and our our president is a dynamo you know but I want to kind of see more structure around it you know and maybe, maybe somebody won't maybe a checklist or two or yeah exactly yeah. that'll make me feel a whole lot better yeah I, <laughs> I hear you okay back here and then we're gonna to go to online. So to lighten it up a little bit, um, everything that you all have said, uh, those are my goals, but my goal is that New Jersey State Police Survivors of the Triangle supersedes what Kim has done. We're gonna go out in the community, we're gonna take all her ideas and knock it out of the park and come back and hope be chapter of the year on well, one year. Hey, <laughs> I love it. Wow. Thank you. 
Okay, let's. I love it. From coast to coast in the room, we got it going on. We got yeah. We, we got a trooper war going on here. This hey, y'all in the middle, war. keep your head low. This could get, this, <laughs> if the food fight breaks out. All right, so let's hear from a few from online. Um, okay, so Stephanie from Colorado has said, my goal would be to interact with our board and our survivors in a professional and supportive manner. <clears throat> and then Troy Shuey, um, to increase the knowledge of local agencies on the mission of COPS, as well as getting the current members more active in their chapter. Which is in Alaska, and that's no small feat. Hi, Troy. Yeah. <laughs> and Kat. <laughs> um, and then Kim, uh, my goal is to always be available to our board and most importantly to our survivors. Um, Deborah from Michigan again. Um, the chapter, her goal for her chapter would be to support the departments and the survivors in their grief, their healing, and share the knowledge of COPS services offered. And then for a personal goal would be build trust with each family and individual and have them know that day or night, she and her chapter are there to assist, support, listen, and care about and for them. Um, just a few more, Annette Bennett, to build better relationships with survivors so they want to become and stay actively involved in their chapter. <clears throat> um, Misty, my goal is to be there to support new survivors but also show them how they benefit from getting involved themselves. And then the last one, Tressie said, to be the support survivors need, even if it means staying in the background until they're ready for the support and to continue to grow membership participation. Love it, great job, by the way. Wow. Okay, yeah, yeah, exactly. Did you hear one goal, and we're gonna break here in a second, did you hear one goal that was illegitimate, um, off point? I didn't. No, pretty, pretty awesome stuff. And you see within the chapters the diversity. D. Wallace, please. Yeah, I, I wanna add yeah. to my personal goal is to help coworkers realize that they are survivors. Mm. I, I know you're going to accomplish that goal. I, I am confident you're going you're to accomplish that goal. So I'm going to add one. I'm going to add maybe a thought. This maybe doesn't become your goal, but I'm going to add a thought here. Because you're all right. You're all correct for your, for your chapter. And I see, the, um, I see the twinkle in your eyes. You share it. And for many of you, it does come from something that was broken. Uh, people that, that uh, relationships that were missed or connections or being uh, forgotten or not reached out to. We had several who weren't even in the first place, either departments or other people didn't know. And, I, and my story, what, 20, 20 plus years with an agency that's losing officers pretty much every year and usually multiple a year. And it took me over 20 years before cops really started um, like beginner's awareness of cops. And I'm thinking like that's not acceptable which is part of the reason why I love doing the TLEs. Um, I would suggest to you, right before we go on the break, that um, building trust and credibility. So you, you gave appropriate, of course, really concrete goals, things you're, you're gonna work at. But all of those are surrounded by and empowered by trust and credibility. When your chapter and the individual members are trustworthy, when you gain credibility through your expertise, through your service, through the programs, through the connections, when you help people solve problems, and many of the times the problems that we're solving are, are really problems of the heart, um, you are working very diligently at that point toward accomplishing your goal. And one of the things I, I, I mentioned, and a number of you did, is to expand the, the breadth and the depth of your survivor community. The breadth is who's not being reached right now or who hasn't been reached in too long. Uh, for some of you, you know that maybe there's been outreach and it's been um, not responded to or even rebuffed, but it's also been a number of years and things change. Um, the depth, what programs and services are connecting, are you as a chapter connecting your survivors to? Are you making those programs available not just in terms of word, but really, are you marketing them? Are you really um, twisting some arms for people that maybe your chapter leadership says, she needs to go to that, or he needs to go to that? Um, and are you making it possible? I loved, I loved uh, was it Georgia about the fundraising? About fundraising? Exactly. So are you making it possible? Are you doing the things like fundraising? 
uh, providing continuous information, really competent information um, to, for them to participate. So we've talked about who you are in your journey. We've talked about the vision and the importance of a shared vision for having a great chapter. And then we've just talked about goals. Now, all of that, this got a little bit more concrete. But when we come back from the break, we're going to start getting into some of the real practical things that can be obstacles or, or barriers, challenges that have to be addressed and overcome. And we will do that in 15 minutes. So enjoy your break. All right. So um, the first piece this morning, uh, by the way, thank you guys for the interaction. I'm actually walking around and... It may be, you may be um, writing down your grocery list or something like that, but there's a lot of notes and highlights and things on there. And I was actually looking for words like bananas and milk, but uh, um, thank you for the kind comments um, that I'm already receiving. So let's turn the corner now. And as we do, I want to actually emphasize just how important it is that we took some time to do a little bit more of the, of the generalized stuff about where you're from, uh, where you're going, shared vision, the importance, how to get there. And then we actually started talking about goals. Because now we're going to delve into the next few bullets or topics. We're going to start talking about some of the things that are both challenging and opportunities practically about running, leading a chapter. So if you all are good, let's, let's uh, jump into that. So um, we, we're gonna, the first thing we're going to take on is leading volunteers. And... Um, it's often uh, the case, at least in my experience, that um, there's some, there, people have different thoughts on this. And, and here's what I mean. So when you think about volunteers, your job really as a chapter leader and a leadership team is to recruit, train, organize, and encourage those volunteers. Because that's the lifeblood of everything we do. All the services that we provide. I mean, we have a wonderful national staff for sure. But much of the work that, that is done, that the souls that are touched, it all starts at the chapter level. People don't generally go to coworkers, for example, if they haven't been touched by a chapter, whether it was going to a local TLE or a chapter member twisting their arm or something like that. They don't go to parents. They don't go to spouses. They don't go to hands-on programs. They won't attend a training. They won't get connected with the chapter unless there's that local touch. But when you think about expanding your reach in terms of volunteer participation beyond your board, everybody knows that the board, well, you guys kind of volunteered or were voluntold, and you, and you signed up, and you have, a, a, you have a role or an official title. So there's some kind of implicit expectation that, well, of course, you're supposed to be busy, and you're supposed to be carrying, carrying some of that water. But what we find is that the chapters that are really dynamic and effective involve quite a bit of their membership, in fact, as much as possible. And so that creates a whole new opportunity and challenge at the same time, because at this point, we have a whole bunch of souls. They may have their own ideas. They certainly have their own story, life experience, and so on and so forth. And as a leadership team, you're trying to get everyone to acknowledge those individu individualities, those distinctives, but at the same time, everybody needs to be rowing in the same, in the same direction for the chapter to thrive. So I want to ask you something. How does leading a group of volunteers compare to leading a, a staff of paid professionals? So, so when you think of it, just hold on just for a second. I, it was awesome. My hands are already going up. Oh, let me tell you. Okay. Um, so let, let's get a couple. And, and if we could encourage the online people, just g give, me a, give me around the room a couple sentences on that and, and uh, right over here. Well, coming from a paying gig that uses volunteers, um, your staff, you hire for particular gifts and skills, skill sets. Okay. With volunteers, you have to build a community to learn their skill sets and figure out where to plug them in in the most effective place, in my experience. Yeah, that's actually very insightful because what is implied in and pretty much stated in what you're saying is you have to, everybody comes from different points, they have all kinds of different skill sets, and you're actually having to do some kind of an assessment in terms of what their needs are to, to be a functioning part of that community. That's, that's man, we started off with like uh, the advanced comment, right? 
Good. Well done. Well done. Okay. Some more. When when you are managing people who are getting paid, you may often get somebody who's just there because they're collecting a paycheck. But when you have volunteers for things like this, these people are usually committed to the cause. Beautiful. Okay. More. Keep keep our runners busy. If if somebody's ta uh, talking, like get get the attention on the other side. Got it. On it. There we go. Oh my gosh, we have a replacement runner. <laughs> And she's got her bike jersey on. For, first, first time? Yes. I love your enthusiasm. This is... <laughs> Go ahead, Brian, you got the mic. In, in my experience, um, coming from a law enforcement background, it's harder to get volunteers to um, recognize that there's a chain in law enforcement, we're a paramilitary organization. Mm -hmm. So to recognize a chain of leadership and your role, you fit in. And um, if you're a PO1, a police officer, basically you work the road, you follow the sergeant or a corporal. The corporal or the sergeant follows the lieutenant or the captain and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. In the realm of the volunteer world, it's a lot harder. and to get volunteers to recognize that there's maybe, I don't wanna say a pecking order or a hierarchy um, is very difficult sometimes and they don't recognize that. So can I, can I put you on the spot basket? Absolutely. Paula? Okay, so what is the, uh, let me ask it this way. Why is that important that they recognize that in, in your view? Um, so, that nothing gets uh, cattywampus, so nothing gets confusing, that the um, momentum of the chapter stays flowing. Uh, there's a, um, stays flowing in the same direction, okay. per se. Mm -hmm. All right, good, this, this is great. Um, ne who's next, somebody over here? Um, how about online, are we getting anything online? Can we? Oh, okay. Sorry. You're, you're, now you're. Uh, yeah. so we've gotten one online. Um, Stephanie from Colorado said, um, volunteers may not always be committed, fully committed to the mission, or follow through with a commitment to the task. Okay. So, so interesting because that's that's two sides of the coin, right? So I got, what's your name, ma'am? Mary. Mary. Okay, Mary from Miami. She said literally the opposite. Mm -hmm. Doesn't doesn't mean you're right or wrong. Right. Is it Stephanie from Colorado is saying the opposite of Mary because what they're they're what you're both sharing is that's your experience, right? Brian's coming in with the take. What, what about a couple others, whether it's online or in the room? What? Go ahead, Pat. That was easy. Oh, that was easy. Um, <laughs> I think the leading the volunteers in our organization is a little different because there is a grief element and people are getting to certain points in their grief um, through the process of maybe being a volunteer or they may land on your chap in your chapter at this point in a year they may grow here and they may not grow there so there's got to be a lot of growth and you're having to help them grow to be the grief is different the grief part of it it kind of hinders the chapter it, it sure is it, and it, helps it too <laughs> so, so this is the question, and a lot of times when you get into a leadership position with volunteers for the first time, and Brian, thank you for, for sharing that, because I think that your that view represents a lot of people, and I'm not here to say right or wrong. What your experience is your experience, right? At the same time, I think um, when you have not been around vo a volunteer environment, most when they get in, especially if they come from a corporate police, some kind of a structured environment, it feels very, very unsettling um, because it's like, how do we, you know, herd the cats? How do we get everybody kind of, kind of rowing in the same direction? And it becomes, and it can become super, super daunting because the tools, the mechanisms that maybe you're used to within a corporate structure or as a police agency, um, sometimes if you try to apply those those techniques, it'll it'll backfire, and you'll lose volunteers, or they'll just do what they want anyway, um, and you're not accomplishing really what, what you're trying to do. 
So um, in my experience, uh, ev in every rank of CHP, and I went from officer up to chief, um, and then in my nonprofit, uh, and then running volunteer teams. In fact, Monday, so it's crazy, so I'm flying back tonight, and then Monday I'm running a security detail for a, a high school trip for 700 kids down to Southern California. And we, we are all 100% volunteer. And um, so I, I, this is my fourth or fifth year doing this. And so just, just running that and trying to um, keep a bunch of 14 to 17 year olds. Oh man, <laughs> I was doing really good. Okay, let me, let, me, let me come back to my happy spot here. Um, so when they're paid, they're obligated. Um, they, you can, as Brian was kind of indicating, you can direct their activities. To what degree they do that activity, um, to what degree they accomplish it is a, is a different matter. Um, that person has their basic security at stake because ultimately if they don't perform and you let them go, that's their paycheck. Um, you can control their time to some degree. According to bargaining units or labor agreements and so on, you can say you need to be here at a certain time, you can't leave until a certain time, you can control the breaks and things like that. None of this is sounding really good to a retired guy, by the way. Um, and, uh, and they're subject to formal evaluation and um, at the same time they respond to acknowledgement and encouragement. What I found in a volunteer organization is uh, similar to Mary, is that they will typically share time because they want to. Um, there's a lot of intrinsic motivation because they were either helped and they want to give back or they were hurt and they want to ensure that nobody else is hurt um, and all kinds of variations on those two themes and others. They usually have a sincere or deep connection to the mission or of the organization they're serving, not just with cops, but in, I mean, there's people that volunteer for the Humane Society and they're, they're super, super fired up. Maybe someone in here does, right? Um, about, about making sure that uh, animals are protected. Um, they'll often sacrifice their time and talent well beyond that of paid staff because of that intrinsic motivation. And they're generally open to feedback, generally. And like a paid employee, they respond to acknowledgement and encouragement. Hey, I see what you're doing, that's a good job. Thank you, you just touched a life. We really appreciate no matter what the task was. So no matter what context you're in, effective leadership, the challenge, is to bring out the best in people. And I think sometimes it's easy, I noticed this on the, the structured side you know, of law enforcement, it's really easy for some, some people in leadership positions to actually not lead but basically direct. It's not, not leading, they would direct and hold people accountable to some degree and so on. But that always limits your effectiveness because the, usually the highest level of um, achievement that you can get out of that is compliance. People will comply with your directive. They will do what it takes to stay off the boss's radar, to not get written up and so on. They may be doing a little bit more from time to time, but at the end of the day, for if you're just directing people, it's about compliance. Now you often in a volunteer organization, certainly a cops chapter setting, you don't have that lever and I'm suggesting you that's probably a blessing because it actually causes you to see people for who they are, find out what motivates them and a couple of you have touched on this already and then lead them by helping them meet their goals, serve them. That's what, that's what leadership becomes is you become actually a servant to your followers. I employed this even when I was a chief. I had a thousand people I was responsible for and every staff meeting, I said to my, to my staff, I'm the chief servant of this organization. My expectation is that my assistant chiefs, you serve our captains and lieutenant commanders. I expected them and talked about this on all of our site visits and our command conferences. I expected them to serve their first line supervisors who, in my opinion, that's the backbone of a police agency. And then they, all of us collectively, are there to serve the detectives and the officers, the pilots and the flight officers that are actually delivering the product and the service and they are the face of the organization. It's how, it's how the public experiences us. So when we took at first you know, people that was, that was really, really foreign, but then as we began to walk that out, it became how can I make your life better? What can I do from equipment to communication, to support, to lending an ear, 
to what's going on with your family. And once that culture starts to change, people, it, it, it awakens them up. And we get away at that point from compliance and it move into loyalty and commitment. The opposite of co compliance is commitment. And many of you are already experiencing very, very committed volunteers. It's a strength of this organization. They will move mountains to get the mission done or to, to have an event get done or to help in, in ways. Effective leaders are able to bring out the best of their team regardless. That means that if your chapter is struggling in the area of volunteers, either you able to get them but they don't stick around or you get them and they, they're, you just, you don't feel like, boy, we're rowing in the same direction or um, you just can't recruit them in the first place. That's always a function of, of leadership. So on one hand, if you're saying, well, gosh, well, that's, that's kind of us, that sounds like bad news and I'm certainly not pointing the finger at you, but the place to start is, is the mirror not only for you, but for your team, and have honest, open discussions to say, what is it that's happening the way we're conducting ourselves? Assume it's you. I've done that for my career, and it, it really helps. It's hard, because our natural inclination is to want to, like, it's, it's something else, it's the climate, it's the this, it's you know, the national, it's the local, it's the, but if you go look in the mirror and say, hey, what am I doing, not out of intention, but what unintended messages am I giving off? What, where is my areas of focus to where maybe the, what I'm talking about and what focusing or my, the way we're communicating or not? Maybe that's sending very important messages that essentially tell prospective or current volunteers that they're either not welcome, not appreciated, not needed. And that's not your heart. That's not your intent. But that can be the result. So the results you're getting with your volunteers, your collective system of leadership, communication, what you reward, how you, how you do all your business within your chapter, it is actually perfectly designed by definition to get the results you're getting. It's perfectly designed that way. Talk about systems. You have a perfect machine to get the result you're getting. So if you're going, you know what, we really aren't happy with the result, not only with volunteers, but it could be with anything. We're, we're just, you know, we, we're not happy with the way that fundraiser went down, or we're not happy with our reach toward a certain um, constituency survivor. Then you gotta be thinking, we need to tweak our machine. We've gotta, we gotta examine the factors and take a good look at yourself. And if you can do that, it takes, it takes courage, it takes maturity, but you will find that some of your greatest joys will come of self-discovery, both individually and as a team, when you overcome that and no one had to tell you, but you realize it on your own. Sometimes I've had those epiphanies and I've cried over them because I realized, oh my gosh, that's a blind spot. Like that's been a blind spot for a while. How many people have I affected? But then the next reaction is, okay, Let's, let's acknowledge that and then let's move forward um, and grow. So um, your job is to bring uh, the, out the best in them. And that last bullet is the re resist the temptation to do all yourself. I mean that as an individual and I mean that as a team. So one of the biggest obstacles or barriers to getting people involved is when an individual or team is doing all the work as opposed to shepherding all the work and, and catalyzing all the work. Um, that is usually the first thing when I, when I hear of a, of a team, not cops or anywhere else, the first thing I look at is how much y'all doing versus how much are you asking others to join? And I'm gonna talk about how to onboard um, volunteers and, and kind of look at that. But that is, that is almost always the first thing that you should look at. In, uh, on that mirror check is are we are we doing everything ourselves and if you are you're probably saying things to yourself like well there's no one else to do it we tried that before and it caused way more work than it was worth um, we just don't have you know people say they want to get involved but they're not faithful or they don't show up and we can't rely on them and it costs you know, in terms of time and money and headache, and I just don't want to go through that, or we don't want to go through as a team, so we do everything ourselves. I understand that, but I'm also going to challenge you gently and lovingly that that thinking is literally what is blocking you getting more volunteers. 
That is literally the thought that is, that is killing you. So what is the alternative to that thought? Because with a group this size and online, there's some of you that are in that boat, and I'm not only not throwing rocks at you, I want to I wanna come alongside and help you to think in a different way to where you can, you can actually grow, grow your influence while you grow your chapter. So how do you do that? I'm going to play this in just a second. It's a scary looking man, isn't it? I'll get to Jocko in just a second. Um, so actually, I'm going to play him right now, and then I'm going to talk about what this, this other thing. I don't know what just happened. but um, So this is Jocko Willink. How many of you recognize his face? Oh, good. Good third or more. So Jocko is a, uh, he's a prolific author of leadership books, and he's got a great podcast. And you'll see his character here, and just, this is just a couple minute video. But he's most known, he was a Navy SEAL commander. So Jocko led SEALs into combat, and um, he is a very fact of the matter point. And he gets a question here. On, he, he has a leadership podcast, it's excellent. He's written several books, they're, they're, they're excellent about leadership. And they don't apply to military, just they apply to what we do. And I found this to be very, very helpful. Jocko. How do you lead a team of volunteers? How to punish or discipline them? Can't threaten to fire them because they're all I have. I know a leader does so much more than threaten and punish, but I need some guidance. Try to, motiv try to motivate, but feel the need to do more. Thanks. Try and answer this one quickly. Uh, once, because this is kind of a, a question I've answered before in a different form. Um, do they understand why they're doing what they're doing and do they understand why it's important? Do they understand how what they are doing will benefit them? Do they also see you working hard to try and make things happen? So those are, those are just the basic questions. Let's just get those out there every time. Every time yeah. someone's not doing what you want them to do, do they understand why they're doing what they're doing? Do they understand why it's important to the mission and do they understand how being successful in the mission will benefit them? So, so let's just get those out of the way. Next, what can we do here? Have you gamified the situation at all? How do you like that? Gamified, gamified right? Have you gamified the situation? Because I, I realize that's a term that's getting thrown around now, but we would gamify stupid things all the time in the SEAL teams to make them fun, Yeah. right? How much brass can you pick up? Let's see. Yeah. I'll pick up more than you. My squad will pick up more brass than you'll pick up. All of a sudden, we're running around the range trying to pick up brass. One of the most miserable things that you have to do in the SEAL teams is pick up brass off the hot range in the summertime. Mm -hmm. And you do it for, for like two days. Because once you get done with all your work, you got to go pick up millions of rounds of brass spread out all over the desert mm. in, in August in the Imperial Valley. It's hot. It sucks. But guess what we're going to do? Have a contest. Yeah, yeah. So what are you going to do to gamify it? Uh, like what kind of cool competition around some short-term goal can you set up that's going to be, that's going to make it fun for them? Some kind of cool reward? What about some kind of friendly bets around achieving something? Like, I bet if I raise this much money, you know, I will go to work with a pair of underwear on my head, or you have to. You know what I mean? Yeah, Whatever right. these stupid bets. You know what we used to do in the teams? Is we'd bet $1. One of my old running mates. Mm -hmm. we, we, if we had something, like, critical, I'll bet you $1. Yeah. That was, like, the biggest bet you could make. Yeah. Because it's just, it's pure pride. Yeah, So, yeah. you know... And then we'd, we'd always have fun if you were collecting or if you're giving the dollar. Collecting the yeah. dollar was just totally glorious. Yeah. Giving the dollar was shame. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shame. So yeah, yeah, like you could add like, okay, when you give me this dollar, A, it has to be in front of everybody. Mm. B, you have to, I don't know, you have to do it while like walking on your knees or something. Something real kind yeah. of demeaning like yeah. that, you know? Yeah, but we didn't even have to do all that. Yeah, huh? It, for, it was just understood. Between me and my runner mate, if we won or lost the bet, yeah, it was yeah. like... What a loser. You know, and, and you wouldn't even ask for the money. You just look at him. <laughs> <laughs> and this buddy of mine, he had one of the most classic looks. When he'd give you the look, when I'd lose a bet to him and he gave me the look, I, I, I wanted to cry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He lost so much yeah. more than that dollar. Yeah, lost a lot more. So maybe you make a bet for a dollar. And if that's not working, okay, now that's not working. If you can't gamify, if you can't have fun with it, maybe ask them while they're, why they are there and, and figure out, what their motivation is for being there and how you can tie that into something concrete. And then also, like, like you might have some people that aren't, aren't really into this. Mm. And then lower your expectations of this particular group of people and go out and recruit some people that want to get after it. Yeah. Makes sense. 
Yeah. Have some fun. Fun goes a long way. Yeah. Fun goes a long way. Having yeah. fun doing things goes a long way. And the, and that praise thing too. You know when you said like add like a reward or something for, because a lot of times especially volunteers where so you know and we all feel this like even at, at work you can have like a super fun job but you get you people generally speaking speaking tend to get complacent in one way or another you know when things are routine or things are you know not as exciting or whatever um and you know when you're volunteering and that happens it's kind of like you're not tied there by a paycheck really you know which is just it's just a powerful tie you know that people have to work it's like yeah i don't like my job but it pays the bills and paying the bills is a big deal kind of thing so if you add that element of excitement or fun or you know a little personal payoff in one way or another i think that helps a lot of the times indeed and that tends to happen too. If the if the lead, I'm not saying this person is doing this or not doing this, but like if they become kind of complacent in not recognizing how much they 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 appreciate the volunteers, you know, like if they're just like, oh yeah, this is just business as usual, you know, thanks for coming in. That's kind of it, kind of mm -hmm. thing. And they, you know, then it just gets kind of kind of blah, you know, like it's it not the payoff that they used to have, you know. But have if you fun. can kind of keep that going, it's <laughs> keep them in the game. One of the best quotes I heard when I was a young sergeant on leadership is that um, the, the role of a leader, or in your case, a leadership team, is the first role is to define reality. Hey, where we're going, what we're about. Like, we're not going to negotiate the cop's mission statement, right? That's, that's part of our reality. And in the end is to say thanks. And a lot of us forget that. And in between, the leader becomes both a servant and a debtor. And I hope you heard what he was saying there. He actually, like, one of his first comments are, people are looking at the leadership team at the temperature of the leadership team. Do they say you setting the example for, for that? Do they say you working hard, showing up to meetings, being prepared, being engaged, um, doing what you said you were going to do without doing it all, but are you setting the, the, the temperature there? And then the other thing, uh, that's that third role is a debtor, which means... To, to have a fantastic chapter as a leadership team, you really, um, as a natural state of being, you should always be feeling like I'm in debt to these, these volunteers. They're doing just an awesome job. That's like a normal state. So what else did you hear there? You heard fun. That came across with all the, the bets. And, and I, I know there, what a lot of people heard was, oh, man, we're going to do that underwear on your head thing. Like that, that somehow we got to incorporate that. Um, others of you go, are you kidding me? But what he said early on is actually very profound. And I'm going to, I'm going to talk for just a minute on how to recruit volunteers. Do they know why they're doing what they're doing? See, in this community, we just assume it because we all have survivor stories and those survivor stories are personal. They're emotional. And we make the assumption that that is the person's motivation. Sometimes it is. But I don't think that's an assumption that we should be making. I think we need to be asking, because often motivation is a little bit more complex than just a single thing. It may have started out with my survivor story, but then it branches out as I interact with life, and, and um, maybe I've got some things going on in my life that have nothing to do with me being a survivor, but it's actually a really, really key motivation for me. And good leadership teams know their people. And I see that as I travel all over. I'm always amazed and impressed. I'll talk to uh, chapter leadership in these different cities that I get to travel to. And, they'll, and they'll, we'll just start talking about their people, starting with the panel, because I prepare the panel a week ahead of time. And I'll, I'll have some interaction with them on that. And then they'll start talking about these highly functioning chapters about different people. And they just, it just spills out of them, what motivates them. And, and, and they'll talk about, oh, and this person's mom's in the hospital, and this person's son just won an award, and, and all this. And when I'm hearing those things, I'm going, this, this, is, this is a strong indicators of a great chapter. But if people are coming into this and they don't really understand, if they're not connecting why they're going to Costco and picking up you know, a, a pickup full of flat water to take to an event, because we're just kind of assuming it. And if we're not saying, hey, l let me help you with that, we're not saying thank you very much sincerely, and we're just assuming, well, you know, they're a volunteer, you know, so on, then we're really missing out. We're, we're, we're leaking out our leadership influence. So here's some ideas or an, a, a solid idea on how to recruit people. 
What you want to do is you want to look for fat people. <coughs> it's true. I was approached when, uh, at one time, and the, the boss said, I see you as fat. And I'm thinking, I'm like, uh, like 170. Like, not really. But um, <laughs> So it turns out he wasn't talking about how I looked. What he was talking about was an acronym, Faithful, Available, and Teachable. Now everybody's a little bit more comfortable in the room. <laughs> Faithful, available, and teachable. So within your whole membership, what you're striving to do is to give people small opportunities to succeed. Initially, it can be really tiny. Hey, could you help me? Uh, I'm going to send out this email to the chapter. Can you take a look at that and give me, give me some feedback in the next 24 hours on, on any potential edits or anything that's not clear to you? Hey, can you make a store run? Hey, would you mind just helping, helping me staff a booth? Um, we're gonna, our chapter's making a presentation. Would you, would you mind driving me or, or meeting me there, coming along? Not even asking them really to do anything. What you're looking for when you give opportunities, are they faithful to that? The second piece, which means they, they show up, they do what they're being asked to do, whether it's just show up or actually do a, a, a secondary task, the available part is, do they have bandwidth in their life to do it? So sometimes we get people that are super pro-cops and they, you could consider them as a potential all-star all -star volunteer, but at their season of life, that's not realistic because their bandwidth is taken up by a whole bunch of different things. Kids, grandkids, uh, sickness, and so on and so forth. So that's one where I go, that probably wouldn't meet the A, at least for now. I'd still engage with them, and then I'd be thinking at the point that that, that availability becomes greater, then, then we might task them. But right now, we can support them and serve them by just saying, hey, we bless you. Do whatever you need to do within the chapter, but we're not going to put extra burden on you. We're not going to ask that. But please, as your life circumstance changes, would you please let us know? Because we'd love to have you more involved in our chapter. And then the last thing on the T of the fat is um, teachable. Um, that simply means, are they humble enough for you to, to actually train them, to show them new skills, new way of thinking? Are they humble enough and teachable that they're willing to kind of incorporate within the culture of your, of your, and your mission of your chapter? Um, that's usually not a tough one, faithful, available, and teachable. And let me give you one other, um, as you're thinking about your volunteers, I'm going to give you one other perspective, and then we're going to move on to the next topic. Um, in every organization, there tends to be this breakdown of volunteers. You have the top 10% that are your exemplary volunteers. And as I say that, you're probably thinking about a person or a couple of people. They are all stars. They will show up rain or shine. They will work as many hours as they can. They will like cut off their own leg in order to get something done. They, they're self-sacrificial. They're just your absolute go-to people. And you love them. You rely on them. You appreciate them. The second is reflective employees, and that's or uh, uh, volunteers, and that's like your middle 80%. Those are people who participate. They're good. They they have a, a, you know an impact, but they're not people who are ne necessarily initiating like the exemplary. The exemplary ones maybe not only doing their tasks, but they're also dumping the garbage cans that maybe someone else didn't think about or was going to do. The exemplary employee will do all that's asked and do it cheerfully and and well done. Um, but they also will be a little bit more about my barriers, like, hey, I'm, I can only work this time, or I can only give you so many hours, and so on and so forth. And that's the bulk of your organization. So what's the other 10%? 10 exemplary, 80 reflective, so you got 10 that are challenges, <laughs> problems, dysfunctional, right? They, they, in other words, they're not, they don't fit in one of those first two categories. They're people who show up and maybe they have a different need set themselves. They've got, they've, they're working through their own issues. They're working through their own grief. And as they're doing that, instead of being cheerful and helpful, they maybe have a critical spirit. They're wanting to always do things different than everybody else and, and a hundred other ways that, that it can present itself. And we don't have the option. Um, what most people do, what, what, if, if you have an organization employees, what happens, what's the normal reaction to a problem employee? I hear fire them, <laughs> dump them. Okay, so I, th th I'm hearing retraining up front. That's very constructive of you, yes. <laughs> yeah, and that does happen. 
in, in really good organizations it does, but I'll tell you what I've seen in COP organizations and not just CHP. <laughs> promote them, but first, before we promote them, we ignore them. And this happens a lot in nonprofits. So what we're doing is we're not sure that we have the leadership skill set to deal with the challenge, either having an interpersonal communication about what's going on and having a loving confrontation, um, an opportunity for change and reflection. That often doesn't happen. Instead, what happens is we kind of kick the can down the road. We're all susceptible to this. I don't care how good of a leader you are. We're, we're all susceptible to it. And we're hoping in our heart of hearts, oh my gosh, just you know, at some point, the plane's going to fly out of the turbulence and we're going to be fine. But instead, what usually happens with benign neglect is, or denial that there's even that much of a problem, because that's the other thing that we do. Oh, yeah, it's, it's not that big of a deal. It, it's gradually tearing at relationships and so on. And there's, it's actually, there's actually a legit issue there. And the reason that people like that end up promoting, by the way, that's, that's fascinating that someone said that is because how do we treat our exemplary people? We keep them right where they're at. We, we overwork them. Yep. And you know what also happens? Often we are saying behind the scenes, like let's say a leadership team is saying like, man, Brent is just a freaking all-star. Man, that guy is everywhere, all things to all people. He is like our most valuable player. And you'll talk about it amongst ourselves but it's often the case that Brent will never hear that from one of the leaders. Ironic. It won't, there won't be an award, there won't be something written down, there won't be an acknowledgement. It's just kind of assumed that, you know, he, he runs on rocket fuel and, and we appreciate him uh, privately, but that's the irony of all this. Negative attention sometimes is given to the poor performer. And by the way, the 80% in the middle, they're watching how your chapter handles the, the challenge volunteer, and they're watching how you treat your best. And that is, has a lot to do with how your culture of your, of your chapter. So immediate course correction, if this is pinging you at all, the course correction is sometimes you need to put barriers or, or some boundaries and structure for your, for your best people. You need to help them take care of themselves. Don't take advantage of their kindness or even their vulnerability sometimes, if we're honest. Put those boundaries and invite others in that 80% to get involved. And then on the 10%, you've got to dialogue constructively. If that's not in your skill set or you don't have someone on your team, reach out to the national office, a person like me, and we can help. I do this all the time. We can kind of help you, coach you through how to do that, how to structure that, how to, what, what, what happens if they go this way or that way. There's, there's help out there, so if you're not good at it, but I, if you don't attend to it, that can, that, I've seen it many, many times outside of COPS um, where that ends up becoming uh, the thing that really hampers the growth of that organization. So you pro none of you probably have any like problem people that bottom, but um, other, other organizations do. Um, okay, so, and I already talked about how we mis mishandle. Um, oh, and by the way, the, the other um, thing is your best uh, source of volunteers, your best source of future volunteers and chapter board members to replace you, you should, and we're going to talk about it a little bit more in a minute, is actually in the middle 80 percent. Because the top 10 percent, they're so hard chargers that sometimes when you put them in leadership positions, I'm sure this drives no one at the sound of my voice right now, but you have such high standards and you're so committed, over committed, that anybody that doesn't swim at your speed do I, need to, do I need to say more? And That's right. But sometimes the, your lower your standards is just actually to reasonable. And, and often the people that, that succeed, that, that go into these leadership positions are that top 10%. And if you're one of those people, you could be your own worst enemy because that's not how like normal people think. And, and I'm a recovering top 10 percenter. I have to be super self-aware, and I had to be my whole career as I led positions, that not everybody lives, eats, breathes, you know, blue and gold CHP. And it doesn't make them bad, wrong, non-committed, any of that. In fact, the more I, the longer I live, I realize that they were actually much, much healthier than I was in many phases of my career. 
But that's a whole different story. We don't have time for that. Um, okay, so lean volunteers. We, we already talked about this uh, and resist the temptation to do it yourself. Okay, so let's talk about how to fail. So if your chapter was um, going to fail, uh, what would that look like? And I want you just to, just to think, um, think about that for a moment. Like we always, we're talking a lot about success and I'm doing this obviously for, for a purpose, but the opposite would be if you were, if you were gonna fail, what would that look like? And what I want you to do is turn to someone next to you, it could be the same person, that's fine. But just for like one minute each, I'm gonna keep this brief, talk about the kinds of, what would that look and feel like if a chapter was, was just failing? What would be going on in the chapter? What would be the leadership behaviors? What would be the, just going on? So you got two minutes, one minute each, ready, go. Okay, about 45 more seconds. All right, let's, let's bring it back. And um, so without taking the time to debrief, uh, I'm impressed by how easy it was for y'all to get into that exercise um, because it kind of comes natural, right? Because we, we live in a messed up world and when you think about uh, failing, um, let, me, let me share with you some of the things on my list and kind of compare it to maybe what things that you, you shared and then why am I talking about failing? Um, so, some of the, some of the um, strongest paths toward mediocrity and poor results, um, leaders don't put in the time. They stop communicating between themselves and the membership. Um, they stop listening. Uh, because we're leadership, we know where we're going and everybody needs to follow. Um, they play favorites and playing favorites enables clicks and um, divisions. Did I hear amen? amen? Wow, that one. Okay, man, that, that one, that was good. That was a good one. Okay, you're not going to like this one, though. Um, gossip and violate confidentiality. Oh, got a few more on that. Um, you operate your, oh, this could be sensitive, too. You operate your chapter as autonomous from the organization. No sense of shared partnership, accountability, 
we're our own, we're our, we're our own entity, our own island. We're going to do things how we want. Um, another one is we to fail is we avoid conflict. And then the last point I have on that is we um, don't plan for succession. We don't look out for the fact that all of us have an ex expiration date. I don't mean like when we're checking out off the planet. I just mean our, our, our usefulness to the chapter. We should all be thinking every one of us is replaceable. Even though your service, there's no one exactly like you that can serve in exactly the way you do. That's true. And the, the parallel truth to that is we're absolutely all replaceable. So if you struggle with either one of those, let's, let's talk. Um, so when you think about how, it, how to fail, those are, those are a few that I came up with. Um, th and that's from a lot of experience. I, you see, I've got some quotes and things, but this is from a lot of experience dealing with nonprofits and things. I'm trying to be super, super practical, not academic with, with our time together. Okay. So let's look at then when it hits the fan. Okay, that could mean a lot of different things, right? Um, so we have just kind of covered how, to, how the, the, the blessing, the challenge of, of, of volunteers in terms of recruiting, uh, leading, and so on and so forth. We just talked about things that fail for sure. I mean, if you, if you engage in those activities, you you're, you're, you're have a pretty high probability that your best case scenario is mediocrity and really a lot of dissatisfaction. The flip side, if you flip about every one of those, right? If you flip every one of those, you're probably on the path to a really vibrant. Um, so for example, you do put in the time. You set the example, but not obsessively so. You show up, you're engaged, people can see you, but you're not doing so much that nobody else feels like they have a role. Um, you communicate constantly with each other. It's a lifestyle if you're on a board. That should be happening a lot, like regularly. And then also with the membership, and you're thoughtful about that. You listen as a, as a way of being. You're just constantly hungering for information. Even if you think it, never assume it. Hey, how, how are things going? How's our chapter? And how are you doing? And so on. You can go right down that list, and succession is something you got to plan for. So when it hits the fan, what I mean by that is something, something happens. Now, it could be something that we're, we're actually wired for, which is responding to a line of duty death. Okay, so it's not necessarily, when I say hits the fan, it's not like a, um, always a negative thing. The event, line of duty death, is always sad, negative. But that's, that's why we exist, right? That's when we, that's when we get busy, because we know how we can help um, these new survivors. It could be within your membership, an injury or illness um, of some volunteer or their family. Do you just kind of acknowledge it, set them off to the side and move on, or do you respond to it? Um, any kind of unexpected conflict. So um, I've noticed that sometimes because um, we're survivors and we have survivor stories, um, there can be strong emotions at times. Um, maybe I'm the only one that's ever noticed that. But, um, and strong emotions, especially if we don't have the same view or vision of something, can, can go from like zero to 100 in like, wow, what just happened, right? Am I the only one? Okay, you all know what I'm talking about. That in and of itself is a, is a hit the fan moment um, because it's unexpected. It came out of nowhere and sometimes it throws you so off balance, you're like, How, what, what do I do? It can be very, very unsettling. And then whenever you're doing a, a major event, let's say you've been selected to host a TLE, there's some work that goes into that. National office does a ton for sure. You're going to do a fundraiser. You're going to you're going to organize some some uh, teaching at an academy or some event. Any of these, that's a that's a positive thing, but it's still it's it's something out of the ordinary. It's something that, that you have to spin spin up to. So for any of you who like um, cooking shows, and I do because my wife does, um, <laughs> we uh, I end up getting to watch Master Chef. And what was the what was the thing before Hell's Kitchen, mm -hmm. with Gordon Ramsay? Right, you with me? So they would always have this thing that they call the pressure test. And so what they do is they, they give them some ingredients and they put them under you know, a ridiculously short amount of time and they say go and then they're yelling at them and all this other stuff. And really it's, it's the idea of when you're under pressure, do you, do you become someone different? Because a lot of us, when it's, when it's normal, we can be awesome people and very effective and then you'll notice 
all of a sudden something unexpected happens, even if it's something that we're wired to serve, like at line duty death, and people will respond differently when they're in crisis or when there's conflict, many people will respond differently naturally. It's not a negative thing. It's just that's it's something to be aware of than when everything is going well. Some people thrive in that. I actually, like for me, when we have like really bad things go on, um, life gets very simple for me. It, I mean, there are really bad things going on. And it, it, I'm wired that way. It just, everything simplifies. I'm able to lead, give direction, so on. And I sometimes get bored and in trouble when there's not like a crisis going. Others of you are like me and others of you are just the opposite. So know thyself. But when that pressure test comes, how ready is your chapter to face any, any of those things? And you, if I took the time, you could probably give me a couple more suggestions to the, that first set of bullets. How, and this is a good thing to talk about. Flying duty death happened today. And for some of you, it's such, it's such a, a recurring reality. Like that's like Brent, that's a silly question because this is, unfortunately, this is what we do. We, we know our stuff. Others of you, you're like, I'm not so sure. What if you had some unexpected conflict? You, if it's unexpected, you don't know where it's coming from, but all of a sudden the emotions are, are high. It, it may be within the board. It may be within your membership. Are we prepared? Are we doing the things now in terms of building relationship and building up a trust bank account so that we have something to draw on when, when the thing happens? Are we providing training? Are we communicating? Are we being inclusive? So the road to hell is paved with what? That's right. And, and I said it during the first hour, it's rarely, if ever, an issue of bad intentions. Especially, guys, you don't have, I mean, honestly, that's not, that's not the issue. But the road to hell is people that have really good intentions that are blinded to their own self-interest or their own weaknesses and so on, and they're not open to feedback. And that can also apply across the board to a chapter. So. Pro tips here. When emotions run high, I almost want you to like raise your right hand, repeat after me. Do not, under any circumstance, text. Knock it off. And I'm, I'm like pulling the dad card on you. Literally knock it off. More relationships are hurt when emotions are high because people start texting back and forth and it becomes a freaking train wreck. That's got to stop. Even if you need to say, I need to not text right now, because you know you don't want to leave the you don't, you're not like trying to ghost the person or whatever, but stop doing that. If it if the emotions are high on an issue, whether it's another board member, your membership, whatever, that's when you need to stop. Literally, do combat breathing, count to five, talk to a friend that you can vent to confidentially, calm yourself down. It takes emotional maturity, but recognize, hey, this thing really has me amped up. It's not wrong to be amped up. Don't make the unforced error, which is the next thing, that out of my amped upness, now I'm going to do a mistake. And once that text is sent, it can't get back and feelings are hurt and sometimes, right, and I'm seeing nods all over the room. It's really simple. Same thing, don't fire off an email. I can't even tell you as a chief how many internal investigations because there was inter interpersonal conflict, yes, even within the California Highway Patrol, of course there was, and then someone fires off an email to somebody else and it's like, okay, exhibit one. Right? And, 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 it's, and it's damaged relationships. So instead, calm yourself down. And what you want to do when the emotions are high is make personal contact. In person would be best. If you can't a Zoom or Google Meet or whatever, so you can see face to face, you can read body language. Maybe, maybe it's something where one of you needs to apologize or show some humility in that, that interaction. They can't see that unless they see you. And then the other thing that goes with that, if you have to, even a phone call even a phone call where you can hear voice, tone, intonation is far superior than any of this electronic stuff. Shut down your posting, shut down the electronics. Okay, that was worth the price of class right there, I'm telling you. It'll, it'll save you a lot of grief. Okay, finally, when you think of teamwork, I'm gonna cover, cover this uh, pretty quickly, but when you th think of teamwork, we've actually covered a lot of this but these are some more pro tips. Be available to one another. Be transparent with one another. Share where you're at and receive where the other person's at. Build competence in your role. You have a role on the board, on your chapter board, so whatever that is, it's like, am I the best vice president? 
What do other great vice presidents and chapters do? Seek that out. Talk to other people in your role. Talk to the national office. Get better at what you do. Um, constantly being connecting and networking. You're, if you're on a board, chapter board, you should just be thinking, I need to be in touch with people. I need to feel what the lifeblood. And I guarantee you, by the way, your trustees, because I know them all, they're doing, they're doing what I'm saying all the time. And you know it because you're, you're experiencing that. Act with solid character. Be honest. Admit your mistakes, stuff like that. We learn what they say in kindergarten. And I put a quote I got from Lynn. You're going to see it right here in a couple slides as I finish that um, I, I, I tapped into the wisdom of, of a bunch of our leaders at the chapter and national level. And, and Lynn says that success, successful chapters have an involved board and engaged membership. That's what success looks like. Okay. I want to briefly touch on conflict, and then we're going to finish. Um, we already, we've already discussed this, how it can threaten teamwork. Conflict can also be the thing that launches you and unites you if you handle it well. It's prone to occur in any organization. So I want you to get it out of your mind as a leader that when there's conflict, it means bad. Many of us, the way we grew up and the way conflict was handled in our homes, it was, it was very hurtful and harmful. And we, you may not have a good mental model for, for that. So that would be, for you personally, a, an area of growth. Right, that to recognize that actually Brent was up there saying that conflict can be good. That's a foreign concept to me. Others of you have seen conflict resolved in very, very healthy ways, and you, you understand exactly what I'm saying. Um, it is whenever you see conflict, I actually get excited when there's conflict around me because that is always the opportunity to, to make a step forward. Um, that's what I've learned. Our normal reactions, fight, flight, freeze, are not helpful. Um, they, they, they either put off the problem or we get antagonistic and that's, that's not helpful. What is helpful is those bottom. One is we overlook it. Someone offends us, you got to ask yourself, is it possible I can just say, you know what, I'm going to overlook that one. I'm just going to forgive them. I'm going to have the emotional maturity. That, it wasn't, realistically, it wasn't that big of a deal, so let me not hold on to it. Let it go. Some things you can do that with. Other things you can't. And the next thing would be to reconcile. Do a one-on-one -on -one and say, hey, when you said this or when this got done, this, this really bothered me. It hurt me. And I, want, I, want, I want to talk about that. I'm not blaming you. I'm just, I want you to understand how I reacted to that. And I want, I want to build our relationship. And right now, that, 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 that affected me. Um, the next one beyond that is to negotiate what's best for all sides. So you may be at loggerheads on an issue. You're not agreeing. It's not like violent conflict or anything, but you just, boy, you can't agree. Then you got to be asking your question. What is best for our membership? What's best to accomplish the mission? And that's where negotiation. The last piece is mediation. That's where man, what, we can't get there, and you invite someone from the outside, either a local resource, the national office or something, to mediate, um, and then so you can, you can move past that. But all that involves proactive interaction as opposed to fight, flight, or freeze. OK, so the last thing I'm going to finish with, and unfortunately, you get me this afternoon. And I'm, by the way, I'm super excited about that seminar. It's really practical on how to engage law enforcement. I'm pumped up about that. Um, so we already talked about succession is absolutely vital to healthier chapter. It is, it, it is, it's not optional. If you want to have a, a really super good run chapter, you've got to be thinking all the time about bringing people on board, letting some, some rise, some kind of rise, and then fall off. That's all part of it. We already talked about fat people. Um, and you all are, and I am, in the in faithful, available, and teachable. And here's a couple of things I've learned. Number one, don't prejudge. A lot of times you'll, you'll prejudge a person. They're lazy. They're disinterested. They're this. The only way that you know that is to offer opportunity. You will kill so many volunteers that will never even have a chance because you've prejudged them. They're too busy. This. Don't judge that. Have an adult conversation. Don't assume they don't have the bandwidth. Engage them. Talk to them. The second thing is create small opportunities. And we already described that earlier about helping an email, show them up an event. We already um, realized that. And then test their fatness with increasingly complex tasks. So if they make the Costco run with the water, and the next time it's like, hey, could you, could you work with the caterer to, to do this piece of our event? Or could you show up and actually uh, lead or co-speak with me at this event? Can you tell your story or something? Give them increasing and just see if they remain faithful, available, teachable. People will typically get to an altitude and they'll go like, hey, I'm good at that level. Or you'll see they'll get excited 
It'll be life-giving, and they'll go like, yeah, let's, let's keep going. Let's go the next step. And that's how you develop your people. But don't prejudge who you think is going to be the next president or, or other position board member. Just put the opportunity out there and let your actual experience tell you who that is. Okay. So finally, and this is like a two-minute video, I'm going to close with this um, because when I came across this a while ago, I, I actually thought, thought of y'all. And it's uh, not only good leadership, but it, it incorporates what we're all about. When this video is done, break, and, uh, and then we'll be back in a few minutes. Be kind to people. Kind deeds are never lost. I get to do a lot of NFL chapels. You see some amazing things with those National Football League players. You see guys that can bench press 200, 300 pounds 20 times. You see folks that are huge, that can run like a deer. You know what stops me in my tracks? When I see one of those rich folks show kindness. It literally stops the world. George Washington Carver said, when common people do common things in uncommon ways, they command the attention of the world I just described your grandmother. I know you're tough. I know you're seaworthy, but always remember to be kind. Always. Don't ever forget that. Never. Lesson from a cook over there in the galley. Son, make sure your servant's towel is bigger than your ego. Ego is the anesthesia that deadens the pain of stupidity. Pride is the burden of a foolish person. You'll never be a great shipmate. You'll never be a great executive. You'll never be a great teammate if it's all about you. You'll never be a great supervisor or council person if it's all about you. You'll never be a great staff member if it's all about you. Rather, make sure that servant's towel is always big. On, on President Cropper's bookshelf, in his bookshelf, he has everyone from every book from Plato's Republic to Lessons in Leadership by Coach Wooden. John Wooden coached basketball at UCLA for a living but his calling was to impact people. And with all those national championships, guess what he was found doing in the middle of the week? Going into the cupboard, grabbing a broom, and sweeping his own gym floor. You wanna make an impact? Find your broom. Every day of your life, you find your broom. You grow your influence that way. That way you're attracting people so that you can impact them. Good enough isn't good enough if it can be better. Better isn't good enough if it can be best. Wisdom will come to you in the unlikeliest of sources, a lot of times through failure. When you hit rock bottom, remember this, while you're struggling, rock bottom can also be a great foundation on which to build and on which to grow. I'm not worried that you'll be successful. I'm worried that you won't fail from time to time. Person that gets up off the canvas and keeps growing that's the person that will continue to grow their influence. You keep standing. You keep standing, no matter how rough the sea, you keep standing. And I'm not talking about just water. You keep standing. No matter what, you don't give up. I learned that lesson from a third grade dropout who was a cook at Cal Maritime. Look in those unlikeliest places for wisdom. Enhance your life every day by seeking that wisdom and asking yourself every night, how am I living? May God richly bless y'all. I just, that, I just watched that again. I'm thinking I should just played this and we could have taken like a super like two hour break. And um, so, hey guys, thank you all.